Like um, this. Actually, I would just like to say thank you to Kathy, and perhaps we could give her a round of applause. Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's pretty fearless as well. Um, She's the fearless one, actually. <laughs> Yeah, we've decided neither of us are fearless. Yeah, we have fears. <laughs> she's scared. Don't, don't tell about my fear. Okay, no, I, I won't tell you what she's frightened of. <laughs> it begins with R <laughs> and ends with S, and it's four letters long. <laughs> yeah. um, so we thought we'd begin by talking a little bit about who we are and why we both ended up here. So shall you start or shall I? You start. Okay. Why did you end up here? <laughs> so, when I was young, I started to get interested in how things come into being. That translated into an interest in cybernetics, but, which is the, the science of complex systems. I, I was interested in how things happen. How, does, how did I become me, for example? And this ended up becoming a sort of political question because I realized I became me through the generosity, accidental generosity, of a lot of other people. You know, I was born into that brief period after the war that is still referred to as the golden age of capitalism, when in fact it was the golden age of a rather pale version of socialism. Um, when we got the National Health Service, the... Um, we abandoned national conscription, so I didn't have to go into the army. I was educated free. I went to art school free. Your father was a postman, though. My father was a postman, yes. So my father was a civil servant. <laughs> he, he delivered the mail. Um, so, you know, I, I came from that brief period when there was real social mobility in England and where people could move a little bit out of their class stratum. Because as you probably all know, the worst thing anybody can be accused of is in, England, in England is to have risen above their station. You mustn't rise above your station. It doesn't matter if you bash old ladies over the head or steal the pension fund of a, of a whole company and the future of everyone who belonged to it. What matters is that you shouldn't rise above your station. Well, for a little while, people were rising above their station. Then, of course, with Thatcher and Reagan, things changed. And that philosophy, which was essentially a philosophy that what was good for, the for people was good for the whole of society, it went into a different philosophy, which is that the richest people were obviously the best people. Um, this was the sort of philosophy of people like Ayn Rand and uh, all those kind of pathetic <laughs> you want and, to say other Rand. words as well. Here. I, I want to say some horrible words, but perhaps I shouldn't because this is being filmed. Um, but I once read somebody describe Anne Rand as Nietzsche for teenagers, uh, and I thought that was a, <laughs> I thought that was a very good. At least Nietzsche was misunderstood, but Ayn Rand, <laughs> you she, cannot misunderstand no, that. No, she one. was completely mis <laughs> completely understood. Yes. Anyway, so I, I started realizing as things turned away from the society being relatively benevolent to people from the working classes like me and watched it becoming more and more hopeless. And you know, around, around about the end of the 70s with Thatcher and Reagan, whereas prior to that, wages and productivity had been roughly staying in step. So as the society became more productive, um, people's wages increased. That had continued until 1979, when it goes like that. So a lot of wealth was being produced, and it wasn't going to those people. Um, and that trajectory has continued. Mm -hmm. People have got, working people have become progressively poorer, relatively, and wealthy people have become progressively much, much, much richer. That's where I came to the stage, when I came yes. to being, actually. Yes. <laughs> I was born in 1973, when things were already deteriorating, so, so to speak. Yes. Uh, I'm born in Turkey uh, to a very political uh, couple. 
my mother was in prison actually, and my father, as a young lawyer, rescued her from prison, and that's why they got married. Literally, no love. Really? Neither. Yeah, no, seriously.、Uh, and he proposed to her actually when she wasn't even out of the prison. You see? That's a good time to get. You know,、it. no, <laughs> cornered her in a way. Uh, they were both political, and you know, my mother was in prison, obviously political.、Um, so I grew up in 1980s, in the worst times,、mm -hmm. so to speak. And 1980 for Turkey is the year of coup d'état.、Uh, like in many other countries,、uh, my country was pushed into Reaganism and Thatcherism through violence. So I was born to the family of the defeated. So to speak. Yeah, yeah. So I was born、uh, without me knowing, as defeated. So that is why maybe I ended up here to start to, to, to somehow to fix the future, fix the world, and with that responsibility, naturally born with that responsibility. But you now are. She's an exile. She, she's、I'm、she's <laughs> in exile. So you, is is it difficult for you to? Can you even go to Turkey now? Theoretically, I can. I, I hate the word exile,、um, and I reject every time they call me an exile because, first, it's not exotic anymore. There are too many exiles, and also, <laughs> also, you know, it it, it it creates this image of me, intellectual damsel in distress, <laughs> running away from barbarians. Through throwing her,、uh, herself into the arms of Western civilization and asking for shelter and so on,、um, that is too—that's、um, giving too much credit to Western,、uh, you know, countries to start with. But <laughs> <laughs> and also, we are all becoming homeless. We were talking about this with you. Uh, I sent him a little piece of writing that I am trying to do about home. We're all becoming homeless, and this is—you know—we've been listening all the sessions before us. I think what we are trying to do is、uh, building ourselves a home here. And John was talking about it. Several other people were talking about it because, on so many levels, we are exiled from 20th, 20th century. All the Certainties of it,、mm -hmm. and now we're trying to find. We are trying to reinvent. We we're trying to discover something completely new.、Uh, and this is the first day, by the way. Now I am going off trajectory, but、uh, or you know, kind of deviating our conversation. But I, I wonder what you thought while listening to today's、uh, conversations. For the first time today, I truly felt what the young generation. Is feeling. I'm 49, by the way.、Uh, obviously, Brian is younger than me.、Uh, so we, we are. It's legitimate for us to talk about young people,、um, because we grew up in that period where there were still triangulation points of、mm -hmm. politics,、mm -hmm. of good and bad, beautiful and ugly, and so on and so forth. But I think this is completely like uncharted waters. And they feel all the overwhelming responsibility, you know, young people, responsibility and impossibility of what they are supposed to do. As a generation, they found all the problems of human history on their lap, and they are also paralyzed. We were talking about this as well. We, they are also paralyzed with a lot of political correctness, incorrectness thing, what to do, what not to do, are we allowed to do, and so on and so forth. And All this time, I didn't understand why this generation is constantly talking about healing themselves, and why they always felt sick in a way, and they are always mocked being snowflakes. I don't think that, but for the first time today, I understood why they they feel so pulled down and so you know so in an impossible situation because they have to invent something. Uh, against this thousand-year-old capitalism, they have to invent something against power, you know, a, a, an organization without power, a movement without a leader, 
an individual that is not melting into us, but also not constantly self-centered. So it's an impossible job. They are surrounded with, with impossible missions, so to speak. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I mean, I, I have three daughters, and the youngest two are 31 and 33. So I, since I'm very close with them, I've sort of seen the lens through which they look at the world. And it's strikingly clear to me that every decision they make, which shoes they buy, what they go and watch, is sort of a political decision for them. So every decision for them is kind of freighted with value. It's, you don't just make a random decision. Every decision has a meaning to them. And I'm not, I don't want to give the impression that they're his, hysterically nervous about everything. They're very happy people. But nonetheless, they have a sense of responsibility that I never had, and I still actually don't have. Um, and I do sometimes wonder whether that sense of responsibility is, is becoming a negative sometimes. Um, there's this kind of double guessing thing going on where, oh, I want to say this, but can I say that? Am I justified in saying that? So there's a lot of qualification of every statement, and sometimes I just want to say, just tell me what you think. I don't mind if it isn't a popular thought, you know. Um, so I, I see that, but I see the reason for this, I think, is because any instances of certainty that they see around them are nearly always fascistic. Mm. You know, the, the, the people who are certain, who really know how the world works, are people like Donald Trump and Boris Johnson and Erdogan. Those, those are the ones who have no doubt that they, that they are in control of things and they understand the whole thing. So when the only examples of certainty you see are those ones, it's kind of understandable that you would allow yourself to be uncertain. And they're trying to, we are actually, not they, we are all trying to find some so, sort of certainty in this mess of uncertainty. But one of the things I, it attracts my attention is that they are trying to build a politics, sort of, that doesn't harm anything, not any other human, not any, uh, you know, animal, no nature, you know, no harm to nature. So a harmless politics, like this is like uh, the precondition, so to speak. And I wonder if that is even possible, although I write about it, like, you know, yeah, we can do this like that and so on. But this is what I think about. Is it possible to create a politics that doesn't harm anybody? And would that actually work? Um, well, is it, is it, and is it possible to present that with any confidence? That's, that's the problem, because yeah. again, you, have, you undercut your position so much, and you expose yourself to a blizzard of whataboutism, we call it. Have you mm. heard that phrase? Yeah, or, yeah. Okay. Where you say, well, I'm trying to do this, and then people say, yeah, but what about the Afghans? Or what about the elephants? You know, there's always, there are always an endless selection of causes that you haven't paid attention to because you don't have more than 24 hours in the day, you know. So, so I think one of the difficulties we see, let's say on the uncertain side of the equation, that's our side, <laughs> is, is this sort of feeling of constant self-questioning and fractionizing, fractionating, where there are all, you know, there's this famous, you might, might have seen it in the film Life of Brian, that famous yeah. <laughs> sketch where they're all sitting in the, in the um, Colosseum, and it's the Judean People's Front versus the People's Front for Judea. <laughs> the, the Judean People's Front has three members, and somebody says, where's the People's Front for Judea? And he's, oh, he's over there, you know. And we're, we're constantly doing that on the left, of breaking up into tiny segments. Yeah. Because, and I think this is part of this sickness that I mentioned yesterday, um, which is the best is the enemy of the good. Do you know that expression? Yeah. So we're never going to get the best. We've just got to go, have to be satisfied with what's the good at the moment. And of course, all that fractionating on the left happens because the right has a very simple mission. The right wants to stay powerful and wants to get more power if possible. So the 
function of the right is to defend the status quo and, if possible, prejudice it more in their own favor. But the function of the left is so different from that. The function of the left is to generate visions about how we could be, how else things could be. And of course, they're all different visions. Um, they don't necessarily agree with each other completely. So one of the things I think we have to do as a movement, if we are a movement, is to be much more bloody generous to each other, much more forgiving, not demand that everybody comes up to the mark on every single criterion that we can think of. We've just got to say, I'll live with the fact that you like hamburgers, even though I'm a vegan. You know? Well, the problem is a little bit different than that. <laughs> hamburgers, vegan thing, in between the factions of the left, of course, you know, there's a history, a bloody history between these factions. Social Democrats wouldn't like, no, Marxists wouldn't like Social Democrats because they were the reason that the fascists killed Marxists and so on. There's always a bloody, a blood story there, so it's not easy to forgive. But then, uh, especially after listening to these sessions as well, I do need, I think we do need sort of a heart that we can all gather around, uh, all these movements can gather around. That's why I think, you know, there are certain concepts yeah. that we have to hold dear, uh, make the consensus, make a contract around these fundamental concepts, and then, you know, let mm -hmm. the others think about other things, uh, about the various other subjects mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, what do you, yeah. Tell well, me. wouldn't, wouldn't um, the beginning of a heart be, we don't want to be fascists? That, yes. that sounds like a rather low ambition, but actually it's a very important one at the moment, because one of the things I realized when I was listening to John talk this morning, um, he was talking, as you will have know if you heard him, about the consumer story and the subject story and the need for the citizen story, which is what his book is about. Um, now, the citizen story isn't formed yet. We suspect it, and we like the idea of it, but it doesn't really exist yet. And the problem is that if you drop out of the consumer story, you've lost the story in which you belong, in which you have some kind of role. Fascism is offering you belonging. That's, that's the attraction of fascism. That's why people like it. You, you're part of something big and it's powerful, and it's dirty, and rough, and strong, you know. Um, this was the appeal of Trump from the beginning, that it, it offered people who were unmoored, who'd kind of lost faith in the story that they've been educated to believe in, the consumer story, because they've seen the collapse of it. But what are they going to do? They're not going to sort of sit there not belonging to anything. That is not human nature. It takes very strong, very strong uh, personal... Uh, you know, integrity to actually say, I just won't belong to anything for a while until something good comes along. Yeah, I mean, like when you say f word faith, and that's my word, um, you know, faith in humankind, faith in politics, and so on. Yes, I mean, like this is uh, the charm, the, the, the spectacular part of t today's fascism. They are claiming that they are beyond and above politics, they are not dirt, therefore they are clean. Uh, so people you know, buy into that, you know, discourse because of that. Uh, and this happened thanks to Margaret Thatcher and Reagan and that era where, when neoliberalism was unleashed, they proclaimed politics dirty. Mm -hmm. That is why I grew up in a time when the word political organization was mentioned, there was the, you know, tone of, oh, it's something illegal. Yeah. And, yeah. now, and, and, and a generation grew up saying that, oh, I hate politics. Yeah. And that was the most popular motto. And I think it still lingers around, by the way, that motto. Well, Even those people who do political activism, they say that, I, I, I hear that, oh, no, we're not doing politics. Maybe it's, not better, it's better not to talk about politics. So as if there is a space mm -hmm. outside politics. I think, you know, one of, the, one of the most important problems of today is to rec recreate that faith 
in politics, recreate that understanding that politics is not dirty and human is not that clean after all. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good second part, yeah. yeah. Well, another aspect of that, that was that whole project of saying that politics doesn't matter, that's not where things are really happening. You know, politicians should just be there to kind of keep armies and defend the state, that sort of thing. They shouldn't interfere in human affairs, as it were. And this was tremendously helped by Silicon Valley. That, mm. was, that was the whole utopia of the internet. Yeah. At last we can have a system of self-regulating things that doesn't depend on that tawdry, corrupt thing called politics. And, I mean, I knew a lot of the people, I still do know a lot of the people in that, who are still in the very last remains of that dream. And really think that that's still a possibility, that we can, we can live without having political conversations. And what, what they really believed was something that I call automaticism. And this automaticism is a kind of disease of the Western mind, I think. Um, it's the idea that if you get the system right, you can just let it run and it will, everything will self-organize as a result. You don't have to be engaged anymore. Um, there's a line in your book that I, I really, really like. By the way, this, this is Eche's book, and she'll be very embarrassed if I show it to yes. you. As you can see, I'm not looking at anyone <laughs> it's, right now. It's, it's an amazing book, and it's actually ten little books in one. So it's extra value. You, really, you read this, and it's like you've read ten books. <laughs> um, very efficient. Sorry, I'm just going to find this, this um, one little... What yes. was it about? I wrote it so I can tell me. It, she, you won't remember it. <laughs> it says, it has been so liberating imagining ourselves exempt from the political and moral burden of having agency. And this is what the Silicon Valley revolution was about, actually. It was about saying, oh, we don't have to worry about all that political shit because the internet and all, all the other great, wonderful things of Silicon Valley, will automatically deal with all of that. And if you think about it, the kind of invisible hand theory of Adam Smith, which is in a sense the, one of the roots of neoliberalism, um, really was, had the same kind of appeal. It said, just get on with what you're doing. Trade with each other, buy things, sell things, make things, extract, throw away. Um, don't worry, the market will automatically make that all for the best. And this, and funnily enough, it's also true on the left of people who are highly organic, who think that we only have to fix a few things and humans will all live blissfully ever after and never have to have dirty conversations about politics. Well, I am very convinced that we will never stop having conversations about politics. Politics is essentially the question of how we share things. Uh, you wouldn't know it from looking at politics now, but that's what the question is. No, but then today, I think uh, there is a new trend, uh, which I call silent removal of consent. Mm -hmm. Because young people, especially... Why am I saying this? It makes me look old, actually. Uh, <laughs> younger people, like in their 20s especially, uh, they don't believe in this shit anymore, actually. Mm -hmm. Seriously. They don't believe in that. My generation grew up believing in the motto of capitalism, like if you work hard, you know, you'll make it. If you work hard, if, if you're successful, you're going to be happy. These are the like, you know, main narratives, mm -hmm. main story actually that uh, capitalism proposes. And I see young people, especially after the pandemic, removing themselves from the game completely. So they are, as once Gramsci said, they're removing consent mm -hmm. from this system. But then there is no sound, there's no noise, it's happening silently. Yeah. So this removal of consent should have been revolutionary, but you know, it is so silent that the political intention of this removal of uh, you know, consent is not clear. And it is maybe yeah. not consequential enough yet. It's, I think it's even worse than that. I think what happened when all the sort of Silicon Valley intelligentsia and the people who followed them, 
and I was one of them for a while, decided to get out of politics. What they left was a huge vacuum for all the people who thought, we can use this power. You know, that politics is very powerful. It controls a lot of things. And when we weren't there doing it, it was an open invitation to, to the right to say, okay, we'll take it over. We can use that. Yeah, today's fascism especially, I mean, like, they first make you believe that if you have this personal space, if you can, you know, put your head in the sand and stay there, it won't do anything to you. But then they come for you in that very personal space and hunt, hunt you down there. So there is no space that is not political mm -hmm. already, but there is no space free of, like, you know, safe from fascism. So, yes, we have to act. But then there is another problem. Many people think that, you know, oh, what is the solution? These problems are too complex. Um, this is something that I keep hearing every time. Too complex, uh, too messy, too little time, you know, it's always mm -hmm. this impossibilities and so on. Uh, and, you know, as if they are acting, there are no ideas there. No, the ideas, the way out, the solutions, so to speak, they're mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. There are too many of them, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes? I mean, like, uh, there are mil there were quite a number of solutions today mentioned in the, during the sessions. The problem is, there is not enough political will behind these ideas, be behind these solutions. So, the lack of political will, the silence when removing the consent, makes me think that the main question today, how do we create the political will, especially mm -hmm. among the people? you can see thousands and thousands of people queuing up uh, before the co coffin of Queen. I'm We're sorry. not getting there. We're not getting there. <laughs> We're not getting into this. Just that you know, it was the first news since in the last night on BBC and today as well. So what is the will there? I'm not asking the question, but how can you create such a will that one of these solutions are taken seriously and mass. And this is the question of John, this is the question of thousands of people, this is the question of many friends of mine, and so on. How do we create the will? The problem is, fascism is incredibly, uh, it has this incredible dexterity, mm -hmm. and this is what you have been talking about, incredible dexterity when it comes to managing politics of emotions. Yeah. They are managing fears, they are managing sense of belonging, they are managing a uh, sense of broken pride. And, and they're dealing with the most powerful and uh, flexible emotion of all, which is anger. Exactly. Anger is the currency of, of fascism. And, and of the internet. We progressives, can, if I can say that, these things are so difficult these, uh, you know, these days. We, 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 it's, and this is one of the political problems of our age. We cannot say we anymore. Anyway, okay, we progressives, I'm going to say it anyway. We progressives look down upon these emotions. Like we, we talk about healing. Today, one of the sessions, the question was, how do you sustain yourself? We talk about, we think about this, but then we don't really take it as, as seriously as a policy on the policy making level. And that is my problem. If we want to put a heart to this, uh, to this new movement, if we want to create a political will, we have to deal with the emotions. And one of the, you know, most prominent emotion today all around the world is fear mm. that comes from uncertainty, that comes from, you know, extreme inequality, this and that, climate change and so on. So what do we say about fear? What do we say to people when they fear? Uh, or what do we say to people when they, uh, what to do about their anger? Uh, what do we say to people when they say that they are hopeless. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about this. The first section in this book um, contrasts hope and faith. Mm. So we hear the, in, in these kinds of discussions, we hear the word hope a lot, yeah. but we don't hear faith so much. So what do you feel is the difference between those? <laughs> <laughs> Brian asks me this question so that you can hate me properly now. <laughs> 
<laughs> because I'm, I am against word hope. Um, <laughs> hope is a very fragile word. I mean, like, it will take me, like, any of us, actually, one minute to make everybody hopeless in this room <laughs> yeah. by listing a few facts. Um, so it is too fragile. And secondly, it is inconsequential. What if I say to you, there is no hope? What would you do differently tomorrow? Nothing. And what if I say, there is hope? What would you do differently tomorrow? You know, would you change your you know, life suddenly? No, of course not. So it is inconsequential. And also, uh, there is another thing that I didn't very much mention in the book. Hope is easily commodified. I mean, like, go on any commercial street in Europe, European city, you'll see all these windows, you know, buy this T-shirt, be the hope. If you buy enough paperbacks, we can change the world, and so on. No, I mean, like, there is no such thing. And lately, I noticed that hope, the word hope, the concept of hope, has become uh, a big part of the neoliberal narrative yeah. just to sustain itself yeah. and it's to con marketing yeah, yeah to convince us that you don't have to talk about neoliberalism you don't have to talk about capitalism there is hope and this system can fix itself no there is no hope actually mm. <laughs> and most of the time there is no hope and faith on the other hand faith in humankind i'm not talking about religious faith but we shouldn't undermine the skill of human humans of having faith in something that is the you know most um, that is the biggest power of being human if you believe in something you do whatever required despite the hopelessness of the situation that is the, the that is the most uh, str uh, that is the strongest weapon of our kind. So if we believe in humans, which is another thing that has been, you know, damaged by neoliberal ideas and ideals, because they made us believe that human is self-centered, human is dirty, competitive, blah, 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 blah. So morally and politically, we have to believe in humans and that they are good, they are beautiful, and they are, uh, they love each other, there is lovable in something in humans. Otherwise, why would we do all these things anyway? Right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we have to take these concepts like faith, love, uh, generosity, kindness, and so on, from the realm of religion and from the realm of self-help as well, um, and bring it into politics, and then uh, retell the, our politics, retell the story of, of our politics to the people, to the bigger masses, so to speak. Because all these words would resonate with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Decolonization of blah blah would not resonate with a no. with your father, let's no. say, with my father, but dignity would. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I went a couple of weeks ago, I spoke at a festival in England called the Greenbelt Festival, which is essentially a Christian festival. Um, and I was there as the sort of friendly atheist. <laughs> a role I often play. <laughs> um, and and I, then... <laughs> and, and I was in conversation with an Anglican minister, a friend of mine, and over the years we've often had friendly conversations about whether there's a God or not, and so on. Um, it became very clear to me as I spent, I spent three days at that festival, that here is a whole huge body of people who know a lot about faith. That's the currency they deal in. And I thought, why aren't we just co-opting all of the religions and saying, you know, all that attention you've been directing up there why don't you just direct it down there instead? How practical <laughs> of you. <laughs> but the funny thing is, a lot of them are doing that. So there's now, there's a kind of movement. First of all, there are quite a few interesting new Christian religions that are virtually agnostic. And they're, they're sort of 
geomantic in a way, in that they, they really think that protecting nature is what they ought to be doing. So this is starting already. So my big project, conceptually anyway, for the next little while, is to try to see if I can persuade religious people who I resonate with in certain ways, having been a Catholic myself um, before I lapsed, mm -hmm. but, but saying, why don't we use our capacity for faith, the capacity you're talking about, to have faith in, in this planet, to, to believe that it could have a future and that it will have a future. Um, I still don't know quite how that distinguishes it from hope, except I think faith is more active. Faith gets you doing something. You actually have to do something. There's a good joke about this. Uh, Patrick kneels by his bed every night and prays to God to help him win the lottery. Every night he prays, please God, please help me win the lottery. Nothing ever happens. And after about 20 years, suddenly God appears in the room in a great flash of light. And Patrick says, oh, you've heard my prayer. And God says, Yes, Patrick, but can you meet me halfway and buy a ticket? <laughs> <laughs> and I keep thinking the environmental movement in some ways, or no, I don't say the movement, I say a lot of us involved in it haven't bought a ticket yet. We're, we're, we're still in the hope phase of saying, let's hope something's going to happen. Yeah. We have to actually do something. Before your idea gets, you know, spreading and like, you know, people get excited, some people get, might get excited about this coalition between religious people and blah, blah. I have to warn you about something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, religion, I'm like, well, I think religion is the sociopathic character in the human history that comes out and like, ah, 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 kills people. Although God, God is, you know, the idea. Have you ever is, been to a gospel church, though? No. Yeah, that's a different kind of religion. I know, I know. I'm like, mm. they're all good people, whatever. Mm. That's another thing. But uh, <laughs> uh, um, the thing is, uh, okay, of course, I'm a non-believer, obviously. Um, God, not God. Okay, let's not talk about God. That's a big thing. Uh, but as a philosophical idea, I'd like to think about that as well. But the faith, the capacity, the skill uh, of faith, Having faith in something is what we need. And today, people, whenever people talked about hope, and there were many people talking about hope, especially John and John, the young John and Joe Jones. Joe and Joe's. Joe. Yo -yo. John, they're no. Johns. No? no, they're Joes. Good, because they couldn't remember my names. <laughs> so I'm on stage, they, I don't remember their names. Would you please tell them this? <laughs> Joe and Joe. Uh, we're mentioning this theater, this refugee theater, and each time they say something nice, they go, so we created hope, or hope was created. And I thought, no, you're not creating hope. You are actually creating faith there. Mm. Because people who are coming to that dome of theater, they are, again, believing in themselves, believing in the fact that humans are good and it is, they don't have to hate the entire life and hate entire humanity after seeing all those horrible things. This is important because we are constantly subjected to the representation of radical evil on social media because evil is more spectacular than the good. That's mm -hmm. it. I mean, like, this has been so for thousands of years. Yeah. And uh, it attracts our attention. So by being subjected to that constantly, over and over again, we are almost certain that humans are not good. So this takes away uh, the fundamental reason of political activity, political action. Mm -hmm. If people are evil, why are we doing anything anyway? Why bother? Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, as a moral stance, but actually as a political stance, we have to believe in people, we have to have faith. That is why I think faith, you know, beats hope, mm -hmm. because it is irrefutable. Mm -hmm. If, you know, anyone talks about hope, just go scroll on your Twitter timeline and then show a video of, you know, a man beating a woman to death on the street in Istanbul, which happens randomly, mm -hmm. and nobody's helping and so on. Or refugee kid, you know, dying in the sea and uh, they, 
she's, he's been pushed back to the sea by the soldiers of European Union, whatever. So, but then faith, you cannot refute that. That is the skill uh, that we should be protecting, we should be bringing in to politics. This doesn't sound, maybe this might not sound very concrete to many people, but actually what people doing here, all these people talking since morning, or since yesterday actually, they are recreating faith. Uh, and what I listened today actually recreated faith in me, because now and then it has to be like any other faith, it has to be mended. And I noticed that, and I, don't, I, I wonder what you think about this. Yeah, I, I, fe I felt overwhelmed. Yes. All this time, I'm, I'm so used to listening to horrible things, talking about fascism, this and that. Uh, I was telling John, uh, I felt my skin thinned. I, I felt like weeping and so on. And Kathy said the same thing. Me too. And I, I felt like yeah. we are like these dogs, numbed by having been beaten so much, we are numbed, and only the beautiful things get under our skin, it gets to us, and we start crying to beautiful things now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's right. Is, when I was listening to Imi this morning, yeah. uh, I mean, what she was telling is a lovely story. We should be smiling, but I was crying, actually. Um, so touching, that story. This is an important emotional moment, actually, that we have to look at closer, because this is how you get to people. Mm. Yes. Because everybody feels this. Yes, yes. Everybody, maybe this, you know, queen dying thing has an even relation, you know, all these people mourning has a relation to it. And I don't want to talk about that, but I generally, this is my general observation. Beautiful things makes you, like, you know, it, it, it brings the armor from you. Like, you know, it, it, you stripped off your armor, and that is too terrifying. Yes. And then faith comes to action there, maybe, as well, because then we can hold on to each other, and, like, we can do this emotional moment together, which is becoming, a, like, a ritual thing. But... Uh, just that you know, I'm telling everyone, mm -hmm. that everybody's feeling like this, like a numb dog. And then maybe then, that is why they are so addicted to this idea of apocalypse, end mm -hmm. times, because it's easy to handle now. Um, I have to quote another thing you said in your book, if, I, if you don't mind. This, I think this is so beautiful, the prose of this. She's a very good writer as well as a good thinker. Um, in return for being exiled from reality, we have been offered as hush money a never-ending childhood, a right to eternal carelessness. I, th I think that, that actually made me feel quite guilty when I read that. Really? Well, I think... Uh, Why did you feel guilty? I've sort of lived a pretty careless life. Really? Actually. When, when I compare it to the life that my daughters live, you know, they're, they're sort of my gurus in this. I, I watch how they think about things, and I think I've got to up my game a little bit. <laughs> I, come from a, I come from a time, relatively, of plenty, you know, when the graph was going up. Yeah. And everyone thought. And I can't help carry that residual feeling. Everything's going to get better. That was, that was the story of the ever-ending graph lines going up. And now they're not going up. In now there's the certainty of it's going to be worse and worse. Yes, and we're right. already mourning for the times in the future. Yes. For the things we're going to lose, actually. And so this I, is another I, burden on young people as well, I think. So one of the things I want to say to young people is I think it's going to get worse for a little bit. You're like Muppet I... Show, old guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have another glass of whiskey. Um, um, no, but I think what's, what needs to change in our society in order to solve the climate crisis, not anything to do with the ideology, but to solve the climate crisis, we have to change a lot of things. We have to reinvent economics. We have to reinvent 
the role of women, the role of indigenous people, all these sorts of things, all the relationships that we have, both with the world and with each other, have to be rethought. Well, this is what the left has been saying for a very long time. You know, this, this has been the project. Now, it's not a question of shall we or shall we not do it. We just have to do it. So I think we will quite unideologically, hopefully, have to build a different world. We, we will have to abandon the kind of economics that's produced where we are now, because it... Tell them I'm not home. Um, so, so I think we are going to, we've got a bad few years probably ahead of us, but I think we're going towards something that is fantastically new and interesting. You know, when this, you know, the story that, uh, for instance, John is talking about, and there are lots of other stories as well, like that, as that starts to come into focus, I think things change very, very quickly. We, as, as that lady I keep quoting, whose surname I can't remember, Astra something, Astra Wolf, is it? We're always losing until we win. And what I see is in situations like this, and there may be hundreds of them going on all over the world at the moment, is bonds are strengthening all the time. Something is becoming stronger and firmer and more real. And it doesn't yet show much. It doesn't show in the media at all because the media are very faithfully facing in entirely the wrong direction, looking at monarchs and politicians and celebrities as if that's where all the action is. But all the action isn't there. It's all back over here. This is my impression as well, and I was going to say it until uh, at the end, and now we are coming to the end, so I have to say it now. Oh, which... um, <laughs> Time passes so quickly. Not this time. I'm like, you know, it was 10 years ago. Was it 10 years ago? Tahrir? Yeah. Gezi, Tahrir, Spain, actually, Greece. My God, I was there, all of them. <laughs> um, then people thought that, wow, it came to nothing. And today I thought, actually, while listening to people, wow. This is how it happened. Yes. Because do you know how Yasmin's, Yasmin trees are planted? No. I learned this in Tunisia when I was living there uh, after the Tunis Yasmin revolution happened. They don't take Yasmin and plant it somewhere else, like a branch and blah, blah, blah. They put, a pla uh, you know, they put one of the roots underneath the soil and they stick it out mm. from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So actually, that Yasmin revolution, let's call it like that, Tahrir, all that, ha you know, what happened then, I think is now coming out from somewhere else through these conversations. Yes. What, two more things, very quickly. We're going to be living with the morality of survival, starting this winter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it can fall on either side. We can, you know, as humanity, be absolutely vicious, self-centered. We can kill each other, like, you know, protect our bread from the other. Or we can do the other thing, like solidarity, kindness, sharing, and so on. Overall, I think going, there's going to be a new trend of, towards morality of survival, mm -hmm. and we're going to see it beginning this winter. And after seeing what's been done in this fixing the future, seeing all these people, uh, nobody tells you this guy, so I'm going to say it. You're doing amazing things, amazing things, and you are actually changing the world. You changed me today. Uh, I had to leave my cynicism, my Middle Eastern you know, <laughs> sarcasm outside the door. Uh, so this is how it's going to happen, and I think it's happening. You're right. It's just not that visible yet. Maybe that branch did not really come out, but mm. I saw it coming out today. So well done to all of you. <laughs>